If you would, please uh, turn in your Bibles with me. <coughs> My text for this morning is from the book of Hebrews. Uh, I believe Hebrews is probably my my most beloved book of the Bible. I really enjoy the book of Hebrews because it just tells us of who Christ is. It's all about what Christ is and who He is and how He has fulfilled all the law and the prophets and uh, how He is superior to all others. My text this morning is from Hebrews chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 4. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And if you would, please, in honor of the reading of the Word of God, if you're able, please stand and listen as I read our text this morning. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. God also, bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. You may be seated as you're sitting down. You bow with me in prayer. And let's go to the Lord asking his blessing. Dear Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Lord, it is my desire that through the preaching of your word this morning that you would be glorified and honored, that no praise would come to me but all glory to you who is all in all, even as we sang this morning, that you are our all in all. Lord, we desire that you would be glorified this morning. Bless the teaching of your word. Lord, I pray that it would be to the changing of hearts and lives this morning. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Hebrews begins in this way. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. Who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the power of his word, when, I'm sorry, by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Those five or four verses sum up the first chapter of the book of Hebrews. God has spoken to us. In the past, it was by the prophets. And he spoke to them in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us through his Son, Jesus Christ, who is superior in every way to every other being. He is the image of God. He is the Word made flesh, who dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He is greater than the angels. Some cults teach that He was an angel, but this is false. He is greater than the angels. None of the other angels, God said to them, Sit thou at my right hand while I make thine enemies my footstool, thy footstool. No. Only to the Son has He given this position. The Son is eternal. From, the, from eternity past, He is present and He is eternally future. He is eternal, unlike any other being. He is the Creator of all things. He sustains and upholds all things by the word of His power. He is superior to all other beings. 
One thing I love about Scripture is this. No doctrine, no teaching of the Scripture is simply for our knowledge. It is for our learning that we may do what God wants us to do and love Him more. It's not simply to increase our intellectual understanding of the Scriptures. If that is all the Scripture does for us, it only makes us proud and causes greater condemnation because we knew what we were supposed to do and didn't do it. It is to teach us what to do. And so, when we get to chapter 2, we have just learned of how, in part, we have just learned of how superior Christ is to other beings. And he says, therefore, this is what you need to do. There's our first application given to us in the text based upon who Christ is. And listen again to that application. The instruction from the truth that we have just learned. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. He goes on to tell us why we ought to do that. But I want you to notice something in verse 1 of chapter 2. Notice who he is addressing. Who the writer of Hebrews is speaking to here. <clears throat> Therefore, we. This is the body of Christ. The group that he's speaking to includes himself. Don't miss that. Is very important. Notice again in verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? The audience that the writer of Hebrews is addressing is the church. Those in the body of Christ. Or at least those who appear to be if not those who are. The audience that he is addressing, the we, the church. Next, we ask ourselves, what have we heard? What is it that we have heard? He tells us here, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Well, that's great, writer. What have we heard? I'd love to give heed to it, but I don't know what it is. What is it? Go back to verse 1 of chapter 1, please. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son. The things which the Son has spoken unto us. Here, he goes on in verse 2 of chapter 2. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, and he goes on. In the Old, time, in the Old Testament, he spoke by the angels and the prophets. But in the last days, he's spoken by his Son, Jesus Christ. What has Jesus Christ taught us? What have we heard? I would like to sum up the teachings of Christ in two phrases to you tonight, this morning. Sorry, it's still early in the morning. <laughs> Apparently my brain has not recognized that. <laughs> Jesus has taught the fulfilling of the spirit of the law. He did not diminish the law. Jesus Christ taught the fulfilling of the spirit of the law. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Some people have called this the greatest sermon ever preached. My brother-in-law is a pastor. And on occasion, he will preach the greatest sermon ever preached. And what he'll do is he'll just read Matthew chapter 5, 6, I mean, uh, 5, 6 and 7. This sermon on the mount. You're familiar with it. 
Read with me, if you would, beginning chapter 5 in verse 17. Jesus, of course, is speaking. He's up on the mount. He's given the Beatitudes. He's told them, Let your light so shine that men may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Do good work. And then verse 17. You are to do good. And then he says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever shall, whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Pause there, please. Jesus says, I haven't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And you know what he continues on from verse 21 and following? He begins to tell them what the law says. You have heard that it's been said, Thou shalt not kill. But I say unto you, Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. You have heard that it's been said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, Whosoever looks upon a woman with lust hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. He begins not to diminish the law. Not to diminish the things in the Old Testament. But to say this is the spiritual, the fulfilling of the law in the spirit of it. The law is fulfilled, carried out in love. And this is the second thing which Jesus has taught us. Jesus taught love, which is the fulfilling of the law. Matthew 22, you don't have to turn there. Verses 37 through 40 says this. Jesus said unto him, after being asked, what is the great commandment? He said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets, and what are they? Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. In Galatians 5, verse 14, we read this, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Romans 13, verses 9 and 10, we read this, For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Love is the fulfilling of the law. What is love? How do we know what love is? Is it simply what I feel uh, I should do to somebody? Is it simply how I feel I should act to somebody? Is there no understanding of what the love is? No. Please understand. The love, love fulfills what every commandment says. I said to you, 
A man that does not take, but gives, what is he? What is that act? Well, that's being loving. He's not taking, he's giving. A man who does not kill when he has opportunity is loving the one he had opportunity to kill. To remain faithful to your wife, to not commit adultery, is love toward your spouse. All of the commandments, if we love, we will fulfill the commandments. How do you know what love is? You go to the Word of God, you see what the Word of God says? He says this is love. Turn back with me to Hebrews chapter 2, if you would, please. <clears throat> I want you to notice the third thing in the text. We've been instructed as the church to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard the things which Jesus Christ instructed us to love God, to love our neighbor as ourself. Give the earnest heed to them, lest at any time we should let them slip. Any time we should let them slip. Whether it's early on, in the middle of the race, or maybe you're approaching the finish line. He says, this passage is for you. This instruction is for you no matter where you are in the race of life. Some people get going in the race and they realize, I have a long way to go. I'm getting a little tired already and it's only the first lap. I'll bail out now. Some people you run, which I don't very much, only when I'm having to get somewhere quickly. But I've been told by those who run and heard from those who run that most runners in a long race will hit a wall. Maybe halfway, two-thirds of the way through the race, they'll reach a point where their mind says, where, where everything in them says, I can't go any further. But they will themselves to push through that and make it to the end. Maybe you are at the midpoint in the race and you're tempted to give up. I don't think I can make it any further. This is for you. Maybe you've reached the end. Maybe the end is in sight. Maybe you want to coast. Maybe you think the prize is no longer worth it. Whatever the case may be, this is for you. Anytime, take the earnest heed to the things which you have heard, lest at any time you would let them slip. Listen to what we read in Matthew chapter 10. Jesus says in verse 22 of this chapter, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Matthew 24, verse 13. And he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. 1 John 2, verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been in of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest, that they were not all of us. The evidence of whether you're neglecting the salvation is endurance. Endurance to the end. Let us take heed to the things which we have heard. Now, look with me, if you will, at verse 3. 
Verse 2 says this, For the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. How shall we escape, verse 3, so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Now, I ask you, what is this salvation which we would neglect? What is this salvation? It is easy for us to identify the salvation that a lifeguard gives. <clears throat> Someone is sinking in the water, <clears throat> they're drowning, and a lifeguard jumps in and they save them from drowning and from the water. A fireman arrives at the scene of a fire, a building on fire, and he rushes inside to save the person in the building, and he saves them from the flames and from certain death. It is easy for us to identify the salvation that comes from a lifeguard. It's easy for us to identify the salvation that comes from a fireman. But what is this salvation which Christ brings? What is it that He saves us from? You ever ask that question? What is it that Christ saves us from? One time, Lydia and I, before we were married, <coughs> had gone uh, street evangelizing and we came across a young man who was also doing the same thing. And what his method of evangelism was is he had a little card, like a bookmark, and he would come up to people and he would say, here, read this, recite this uh, card and you'll be saved. And the card had something on it uh, along the lines of, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord and that He rose again from the dead. He said, I've led 236 people to Christ tonight. Some number like that. Um, 200 people got saved. Saved from what? I don't know that he could have answered that. What were they saved from? What is it? What salvation is it that Jesus Christ brings? Read the announcement of his birth with me, if you would. Well, just listen. I won't have you turn there. It's short. Matthew 1, verse 21 says this. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus Christ has come to save you from your sins. To pull you out of sin. Just as a lifeguard would pull you out of the water. Just as a fireman would pull you out of the flames of a burning building. So Christ has come to pull you out of sin. And what is sin? But the transgression of the law. Sin is the breaking of the law of God. And God has come, Christ has come to pull you out of that lifestyle. To make you a holy people, separate from sin. And purify unto Himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. He has come to break the chains of sin that you are bound to. That you may now yield yourselves servants of righteousness unto holiness. So many people want to come to Christ and yet continue in their sin. They're thrown uh, the life vest. They're thrown the 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 uh, what's that? Uh, what's the what's the little ring that the lifeguard throws to the person? You know what I'm talking about, right? 
They're throwing the, the little donuts. <laughs> and they grab onto it because they want to be saved. But they say, don't pull me out of the water. I want to stay here in the waves, in the wind, and in the drowning water. I just want to hold on to the donut. Christ has not come to leave you there. But to pull you out of the water. Out of the drowning, out of sin. Christ has come to save us from our sins. Not that we may continue in sin. Salvation is salvation from sin. And salvation is salvation from wrath. The wrath of God. Romans 5 verse 9 says this, Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. We're not only saved from the waters, but from drowning. We're not only saved from the flames, but the perishing in the fire. <clears throat> the wrath which we deserve was poured out upon Christ that we may no more be partakers of that wrath, but of the glory of heaven. Christ has come that we might be saved from the wrath to come. Neglect not so great salvation. Now then, look with me back at verse 1. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. We should let them slip. How do we neglect this great salvation which we may have through Christ? How do we let this slip? Turn over just a page with me. Maybe it's a page to chapter 3. <clears throat> My Bible, it's the next page over. Hebrews chapter 3, and read with me in verse 7. This is a lengthy passage. But how do we neglect this great salvation? How do we let the things which we have heard slip? How do we let love slip away? Just the keeping of the law. Verse 7, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear His voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Wherefore, he says in verse 12, Take heed, brethren, <clears throat> lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. How do we depart from the living God? Unbelief. And so what do we do? Verse 13, But exhort one another daily while it is called today. Why? Why? Lest any of you be hardened, how? Through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said, today, if you will hear His voice, today, if you will hear His voice, harden not your heart in the provocation. For some, when they heard, did provoke. Howbeit, not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? But to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? But to them that believed not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. We are saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast.
We do not enter in because of unbelief. Because we have not believed. And yet he tells us here that we can let this belief slip away. Our hearts can become hardened. When we indulge our flesh, when we walk in sin, sin deceives us. When we yield to it, and our heart becomes hardened. James 1 verse 15 tells us this, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. We say, oh, it's just a little sin. It's a small thing. Surely God will forgive me. You say, oh, I'll, I'll do this and I'll ask forgiveness later. No. Sin hardens the heart. Therefore, don't indulge yourself in the lust of the flesh. The desires of sin, which are pleasant for a season, but in the end bring death. How do we slip away? By giving to sin. By not heeding the things which Christ has said. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God. How do we know what this love is? All of the law tells us this is what love is. So then, let us give the more earnest heed. How do we not neglect this salvation. How do we not neglect it? We can neglect it, let it slip away. How do we keep from it? How do we not neglect salvation? He tells us. Give the more earnest heed to the things which you have heard. Verse 2. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed. This was the whole instruction. This was the whole thing he was getting to in chapter 1. Jesus Christ has spoken to us and he's greater He's superior to all things. Therefore, listen to what He says. Give abundant heed to what He says. Don't let it slip away. <clears throat> the more earnest heed could also be translated in this way. More superabundant heed. Superabundant. Abundant. Overflowing. Super abundant, overly overflowing. Intelligence. All earnestness. <clears throat> Let your passion be here in the giving heed to what God has told us, the instructions which Christ has given us, and all of the Word of God. But don't hear it heed it. There's a big difference between hearing and heeding. To hear means it comes into your ears and passes into your mind. To heed means it, you hear it, it comes in your mind and goes out through your actions. It is carried out through your hands, your feet, and each one of your members. You see, those who hear but don't heed deceive themselves. They're like a man who looks in the mirror and sees what he looks like, sees what he needs to do, and his hair is a mess. His face is dirty. And he realizes, I need to brush my hair. I need to wash my face. and then walks out of the bathroom and forgets what he looks like. That's the man who hears, but doesn't heed. But it's the man who takes the comb and brushes his hair. It's the man who turns on the water and washes his face. He saw the need, he saw the dirt, and he dealt with it. That man shall be blessed in his deeds.
This is the man that heeds the things which he has heard. This is the man who is not neglecting this salvation, this great salvation which Christ has brought. This is the man who is not letting it slip away. But is faithfully all for the race, heeding the Word of God and what it says. Now, if you would, bow your heads with me and close your eyes. Pray. Let's pray. Maybe this morning the Lord has spoken to you of some sin in your life. You know the Lord has showed it to you. And you need to deal with it. You've hardened your heart numerous times to the instruction that God has given you. You said maybe, I'll do it later. When God says, do it now. And your heart is hardened to Him. You turn it away. And you need that hard heart removed. The ha a soft heart given to you. I invite you to come now. I'll come down to the front, or you can come down to the altar. If there's anything that you need to deal with before the Lord, maybe your heart has never been given to the Lord. Maybe Christ has never delivered you from sin and wrath to come. You've never been saved. Maybe you have never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you want to do that this morning, I invite you to come as we sing 307.